Hey there, folks. My name is Dan Goodman, and I want to welcome you to Stormwind Studios' succinct held online remote training sessions, or as we like to call them, shorts. Why do we need to have an acronym for something like that? Because I have a microphone, and you don't, so you will listen to what I have to say. That being said, this is the second short in the Wireless LAN Essentials series of shorts focusing on 802.11 specifications. As far as our main topics are concerned, we're going to briefly cover the 802.11 protocols, which focus primarily on our wireless LANs, such as 802.11G, N, and AC. The other 802.11 protocols that you should be aware of would be things like 802.11E, H, and I. Now, each of these items are considered amendments to the main 802.11 standard. And in all honesty, some of them are just included in our discussion for historical purposes. So we can kind of appreciate where we came from to where we currently at now at this point in time in wireless networking. So as far as the 802.11 specifications are concerned, as I mentioned in an earlier short, the 802.11 protocols document the wireless technical standards. There are over 30 of them within the 802.11 family. The first ones we discuss are the ones most closely tied to wireless LANs, kind of the whole reason we're here to begin with. The 802.11b amendment, to use the correct terminology, was introduced way back in 1999 with data rates of 5.5 and 11 megabits per second via complementary code keying, otherwise known as CCK, using the 2.4 gigahertz band. Now, the original standard would have to pad one bit of data with 10 extra bits to overcome noise, interference, etc. CCK improved upon this by taking four bits of data at a time. Now, the devices could change their modulation and coding to take advantage of different data rates. If you're kind of confused about the padding of the data, it's very similar to how the phonetic alphabet works. If we were talking on the walkie-talkie and I said A, V, D, you probably wouldn't be able to pick it up. But if I say Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, I pad it so that you can pick up and say A, B, C, D, whatever. Same line of thinking here way back in 1999. Now, the 802.11a uh, uh, amendment, let me say that correctly, specification and protocol always get messed up there, was ratified also in 1999, a little bit later on, and moved beyond the limitations of the 2.4 gigahertz band to leverage more channels and higher data rates. A lot of non-802.11 devices like microwaves and cordless phones use the 2.4 gigahertz band. So by using the 5 gigahertz band with 802.11a, we didn't have as many devices to compete with. Now it utilized something that sounds made up, but it's actually a real thing orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, otherwise known as OFDM, to send data bits in parallel over multiple frequencies. Now you wanna think of OFDM like making a million dollars by making a bunch of $100 sales instead of one big giant $1 million sale. A lot of little sales add up to a big sale. Well, in wireless terminology, instead of sending one big giant piece of information at a time, it sent a lot of little pieces, which eventually added up to one big piece of information. Now, it wasn't very popular at the time because most computer hardware was designed for the 2.4 gigahertz band. Fast forward to 802.11G in 2003. This was uh, 2003's attempt at the best of both worlds, but we're going back to the 2.4 gigahertz band. It began the trend of faster speeds with broader coverage, which is something we didn't have in the early goings. You would either get faster coverage at a, a, a smaller distance, or you would get longer distance at a slower data rate. The 802.11a speed via OFDM was combined with the 802.11b coverage to give us 802.11g. Technically, it was backwards compatible with 802.11b, but this came at a cost. The G devices could slow down to the B speed, but the B speed could not speed up to G. So if you had one single B device, 
technically everybody would have to slow down to accommodate that. It would kind of be like a couple of 18 wheelers blocking every line on the freeway. Every single buddy is going to be stopped behind those two big trucks. Now, the 802.11n was released in 2009 to keep pace with the increased Ethernet speeds. It had a theoretical maximum of 600 megabits per second by using multiple radio chains. Now, a radio chain means we have at least two transmitting antennas and one receiving antenna. This was officially called MIMO or MIMO, depending on how you pronounce the I. Multiple input, multiple output. I tend to say MIMO, that's because that's just the way I pronounce it. Tomato, tomato. Now, a handful of other developments helped to achieve the big jump in speed, reliability, etc. A number of advancements like channel aggregation, spatial multiplexing, MAC layer efficiency, transmit beam forming, maximal ratio combining. Each of these require more time to discuss, but this is just a short. So we just want to throw those terms out there and kind of circle back to them when we've got the time to do so. Periodically, the IEEE will go around and actually wrap up these legacy specifications, kind of like the old school service packs we used to have. So everything from 802.11n going backwards was wrapped up in the 802.11-2016 standard. They did it in 2012. I think they did it in 2008. They did it in 1999. So periodically, they kind of lump them all together. Today, we have what's called 802.11ac, which was ratified in 2014 and released in two waves, wave one and wave two, to give vendors a chance to catch up to the new hotness, so to speak. Basically, it brought wireless networking on par with gigabit ethernet by improving on many of the things that 802.11n introduced. Better channel aggregation, better spatial multiplexing, better MAC layer efficiency, better transmit beam forming, better MRC. Now, only, for lack of a better term, the 802.11ac standard is limited only to the 5 gigahertz band. You got all that data, all these bigger, better things, you need more power, which means you need the higher frequency. Now, as far as some of the other specifications are concerned, just to kind of quickly summarize them here, the uh, quicker one or two liners about these specifications, not because they're not important, it's just that we don't have a need to go into tons of detail about them right now. So the 802.11e specification it identifies quality of service or QoS enhancements for wireless LANs to support voice over wireless LANs and streaming media. 802.11h added dynamic frequency selection to detect radar signals and, channel, and change channels to avoid noise. Transmit power control gave equipment the ability to adjust its power levels based upon regulatory requirements. 802.11i has an asterisk next to it because this is actually one that we'll talk about during our wireless security short. It specified the security mechanisms, things like encryption and authentication, for Wi-Fi protected access. That is also known as WPA or Robust Security Network, R RSN. 802.11k focused on better management of the radio frequency spectrum. It helped access points better distribute their client or workload. 802.11r, you want to think R stands for roaming because 802.11r redefined how clients quickly and securely roam amongst access points. 802.11w is the Integrity Group Temporal Key or IGTK to protect broadcast traffic at the MAC layer. And finally, 802.11u defines mobile communications for devices to join wireless LAN anywhere. Something else that we're going to circle back to down the road. So that's all we have for this short. Thanks for watching our short on wireless LAN essentials. Make sure you subscribe to our channel so that you're notified of new shorts in the future. Take care.